The energy industry is the industry that powers every other industry. To the extent energy is cheap, plentiful, and reliable, human beings thrive. To the extent energy is unaffordable, scarce, or unreliable, human beings suffer. Alex Epstein is here. He has written the book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Mr. Epstein, are you a scientist? No, philosopher. You're a philosopher? Yes. Okay. Well... This is the Environment and Public Works Committee. I think it's interesting we have a philosopher here talking about an issue. It's to teach you how to think more clearly. Well, you don't have to teach me how to think more clearly. I wear this I Love Fossil Fuel shirt, so I do get recognized there, not always positive. Everything you're wearing, whatever made it possible for you to get here, is made possible by energy. And it's not just energy in general. You have to produce it cheaply, reliably, scalably, efficiently. These fuels are far cheaper, more plentiful, more reliable than anything else. They're essential to billions of people's lives. So every aspect of your life, you can't even isolate one because it's the cost of your food, the cost of your clothing, the cost of your shelter, the success of your business, your ability to take a vacation, the cost of you know all the different modern miracles, the cost of your health care, they're all tied to energy. We've been at this energy business for years and years and years, and we need to find a more effective way of, of telling our story and communicating what we do. Uh, he's been a good friend. I've, I've seen his presentation uh, a number of times, his delivery and his thought-provoking way of communicating the energy space is intriguing. So, uh, Alex, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to come down and join us and uh, welcome you up here to uh, begin the presentation. My goal today is to motivate and empower you to champion fossil fuels. I had no interest in energy for the first seven years of my career. I was interested in every topic imaginable. I wrote about things like foreign policy and economics and different kinds of controversy, I mean, cloning, anything you can imagine, but I had virtually no interest in, in energy. And then what happened was I learned a fact that might seem completely obvious, but really changed my life and changed my perspective on the importance uh, of energy. And that is, the fact is that energy is the industry that powers every other industry. So. The energy industry is the industry that powers every other industry. Let me give you uh, a, a graph, which I think is basically the most important, is the most important chart that, that there is. So on the top left, you have CO2 emissions, which historically, since we've mostly used fossil fuels for energy, when we've had a lot of energy, that basically means fossil fuel use or energy use. And then you see life expectancy, and you see GDP, and you see population. So what you see is that for a huge amount of time, and this is just beginning in the year zero or the year one, but it really goes back you know, tens of thousands of years. Human beings have a life expectancy of around 30. Like it's just stagnating there. And then GDP, so that's, that's our income. That's how many resources we have in our lives. That's stagnating. And then the number of people that the planet can hold is stagnating. And then something happens you know, starting in the 1800s where all of that starts going way up. So whereas in the 1800s, you know, beginning of the 1800s, I'd have a chance at living at 30 to 30, now I'm likely to live to 80. And in the 1800s, early 1800s, where I would have very little control over my life in terms of what, you know, what I do for work and what I do with my free time and even having any free time. And I, I would just have so few resources. And then there would be very few of us, so I probably wouldn't even be born. And so now we have this, we have this amazing thing where we've got seven and a half billion people and yet we live at a higher level than anyone ever has. And it's just, and we live longer than anyone ever has. And this correlates really strongly with, with uh, fossil fuel use and then energy use. And so what this conveyed to me is, oh my gosh, energy is so important. And it could be a random correlation, but as I'll talk about, it's not a random correlation. One of the big reasons why is this idea that energy is the industry that powers every other industry. We had what's called an industrial revolution, which means that instead of being just isolated individuals producing our own stuff at home on a small scale, we figured out how to produce things as industries on a large scale. So instead of being biased and sloppy, we want to be even-handed and precise. So I decided that what I'm going to do is what I, I'm going to try to figure out 
particularly with fossil fuels, what's the actual story? What should the role of fossil fuels be in our lives going forward? And so what I need to do is I need to look at the benefits and the drawbacks of fossil fuels and all of the alternatives. And the key idea is that to look at the benefits and the drawbacks, it means I want to look at the overall impact of using them versus not using them. And when I'm looking at the impact, one other idea is that the way I think of it is I'm looking at the impact on human flourishing. So that's whenever we're talking about thinking about the benefits and drawbacks to something, we have to be clear on what's our goal. What are we measuring good and bad by? And so for me, my, the way I measure things is by human uh, flourishing. Now that's, that's a term that maybe you haven't heard a lot. Who's heard that term before? I'm just curious. Anyone heard that term? So the, here's the reason why I like that, that term, human flourishing. So to flourish means, for plants, it means to flower. But it really means for something to live to its fullest potential. And so what I think about for me, what I want for myself and what I want for other human beings is I want to be able to live to my fullest potential. And that really means I want to be able to live a long time. And then I want to be able to enjoy that. I want it to be rewarding. I want to have a lot of control over my experience of life. So when I'm looking at different kinds of things, whether it's the benefits of fossil fuels or concerns about climate, I want to all map that to human flourishing. In, in a lot of the debates today, people talk very little about the value of energy. They just take energy for granted or think that, oh, it's just what, you know, I just think about it when I pay my power bill or my gas bill. And that's the way I thought of it until I started studying it. And now I think of it as much deeper in my life. So here's, here's a, this is an image that really captures to me what abundant energy and advanced machines have done to our world. This is New York, which was just a patch of dirt and trees. And now it's this uh, amazing city, which can you know, give life to millions and millions uh, of people. And the reason that we have New York, the reason that we have other cities is because we've decided the natural environment by itself isn't good enough. It doesn't allow us to live in the way that we want to live, so we want to transform it. And to transform it, we need a lot of energy. And this, by the way, really puts me in opposition to the modern green movement, because the green movement says that we should minimize our impact on nature. And, and I totally disagree with that. If you wanted to minimize your impact on nature, we should have never had a New York City. And you should also never have kids. That's the worst thing you can do in terms of impact. That's much worse than living out of a running Hummer, having kids, right? Because you're, you're replicating yourself and they're having more impact. So, and, and if you really think impact is bad, have you ever seen those maps of North Korea and South Korea at night? North Korea has like one light, which is just the dictator's light, and then everything else is dark. And then South Korea is full of light. So North Korea is the greenest country on earth. So there, I, I totally agree, disagree with this green philosophy. My philosophy is, it's not anti-environment, it's pro-human flourishing. So human flourishing means we have a good environment, but a good environment is one that's a good environment for humans. So it's one where we keep the best natural features, but then we also add on a whole bunch of man-made features. I, I think of it as we don't want to save the planet from human beings, we want to improve the planet for human beings. And one of the reasons I love fossil fuels is because overwhelmingly they help us do that. They've helped us make the planet a much better place for human beings. But then the question is, do we really need to use fossil fuels? Did we need to use them before? And certainly do we need to use them now? It turns out that fossil fuels are a slightly lower percentage of the world's energy than they used to be but we're using way more energy. So we're using almost twice as much fossil fuel energy as we were in 1980. And I think that's overall been a very good thing because life has gotten much better for a lot of people since 1980, in large part because they've had abundant energy. To understand the cost of energy, you can't just look at one input, you have to look at the total process. So when we're comparing forms of energy, we're comparing total processes. Nature doesn't give us any just electricity that we can use on demand. We need to take raw energy from nature, and then we need a whole complex process to try to turn it into cheap, plentiful, reliable energy. The reason we use fossil fuels is because that's the industry that has figured out processes to give us cheap, plentiful, reliable energy for billions of people in all the forms that we need. And it turns out that's really, really uh, difficult. The fossil fuel industry is uniquely good at producing cheap, plentiful, reliable energy. So here's an indication of some of the difficulties of the wind and solar process. So this is 
uh, data taken from Germany, which is often considered to be the model that we should follow. So you see solar at the bottom, that's black, and then wind is gray. And you sometimes hear, oh, well, the sun and the wind, even though they're, even though they're unreliable individually, if you add them together, then they're going to balance out magically. And that doesn't make any sense, and, and it's not true. If you see, for instance, in Germany, um, particularly in the winter parts of the year, you get parts, you get parts of the year where you're basically down to zero. So as in the sun is, isn't shining or there are a lot of clouds and the wind isn't blowing. They call it dark calm. And so here's the thing. If you're trying to rely on fuels that can go down to 0%, what percent backup do you need at all times? You need 100% backup. But that means that you have to not only build the unreliable energy system, then you have to build a reliable energy system with it. But what's going to cost more? An unreliable plus a reliable or just a reliable energy system? Right? It's going to always cost more to add the unreliable energy system because it might save you a little bit in fuel to have the unreliable energy system, but it actually turns out not to save you much fuel because when you're basically when you have an unreliable energy system, when you're trying to run on unreliable fuels, what you have to do is every time there's more sun, you have to cycle your gas down. And every time there's less sun, you have to cycle your gas up. So that's exactly like stop and go traffic, right? You're operating your power, your reliable power sources like stop and go traffic. Well, what happens to fuel efficiency when you're in stop and go tra traffic? Does it go up or down? Right, it, it plummets. And so a lot of what we're seeing on our grid is energy becoming way more expensive because we've added all of this unreliable energy infrastructure and we've made our reliable energy a lot more expensive. So what, what we see in places that are using even relatively small amounts of unreliable energy, Germany is getting about 5% of its overall energy from solar and wind. You know, their prices of energy, particularly like electricity, are going way, way up. And in the United States, at places like California that have used more and more of what, I, I don't call them renewables, I call them unreliables. The more unreliables you use, the more your prices go up. So it's, it's really scary to me that people talk about, oh yeah, well, if only we use solar and wind, everything would be cheap and great. No, there's no evidence that those can actually give us the abundant energy that fossil fuels give us now. It's, it's interesting. Okay, so let's talk about then in, environment. Because people think, well, okay, aren't there these big drawbacks environmentally? And the answer is sort of, but there are also a lot of benefits. So if we take uh, water, the example that a gentleman brought up before, we need to look at both the drawbacks and the benefits in water and everything else. So with water, you see there is a correlation between fossil fuel use and improved access to clean water. And a big reason, as I mentioned before, is that nature doesn't give us the clean water we need. We need to pump it to where it's needed and we need to purify it. And that involves energy as well as the rest of the technology in our world. Now what about climate? Because climate is considered the realm that is definitely getting really, really bad. You'll hear things like we have 12 years to live. Now, my main question, because I'm looking at everything from a human flourishing perspective is, at, so far at least, what's happened to the livability of our climate? Has the climate been a really dangerous place for human flourishing? And I, I thought before I studied this that the climate had become more dangerous, but that, we, that all the other benefits of fossil fuels made it worth it. But then when I saw the data, there's actually data on how dangerous is the climate over time, and it's called climate-related deaths data, so it tallies how many people die from storms and flood and heat and cold. And this is really fascinating, because it turns out that as CO2 emissions have gone up, climate-related deaths go way down. Anyone have any idea why that is? Heating air conditioning. Heating, air conditioning. What else? shelter, yeah, so these, these, all of these things that are easy to take for granted, these are all climate protection devices. They're climate enhancement devices and climate protection devices. So yeah, what's happened is that I believe we have made the climate a little bit warmer, although not a lot warmer, but what we've really done is we've made ourselves safer. We've taken the naturally dangerous climate and we've given us ourselves an unnatural level of climate protection. So fossil fuels are key to protecting ourselves from any climate. Now in the US even, we, we experience every climate you can imagine, right? We have polar Alaska, we have swampy Florida, we have uh, Houston, and you know, it's, we don't always think those are too pleasant, but they're infinitely more pleasant because we have a lot of energy and a lot of technology. 
And so we have billions of people in the world who don't have that, and they're the ones really vulnerable to climate. Now, I believe that these benefits, the environmental benefits even out, have so far at least outweighed the environmental drawbacks. There are drawbacks. I think the biggest one historically has probably been not climate, but air pollution. And, but what we see with air pollution is that's something that has dramatically decreased over time thanks to technology. So what we have in the world is, if we look at the role of fossil fuels so far, it's played this amazingly positive role. And actually, um, besides increasing CO2 emissions, which I want to talk about in a minute, you can do it far more cleanly than you ever could in the past. So there are billions of people in the world who, given the current state of the industry, which is becoming more and more productive, discovering more and more resources, you have decades and decades and decades where the industry can provide more energy for more people, allowing them to live better lives and do it more cleanly. So all of this is possible. So the only questions are, one, are there really better alternatives? And as I've indicated, the answer is, is, is mostly no, uh, particularly not the solar and wind alternatives. And then B, how big an issue is climate going forward? So with the, the alternatives, um, oh, I just on this slide, I should mention that uh, it's important to recognize that so far, fossil fuel use has been incredibly positive. And whenever I hear an expert talk and they, and they just condemn fossil fuel use and they say, oh, this has been so bad, or the world is horrible, it's never been a worse place. If people don't acknowledge that the world is amazing today and that fossil fuels have had an indispensable role, then I will never trust them to predict the future because they can't even predict the present. Like we live in the best planet ever and they think it's horrible. So of course they're gonna get the future wrong. Now if they do, it's still legitimate to say, well, there are better alternatives or CO2 is gonna become a problem. Those are at least plausible, so I wanna explore those. So with the energy, the question is, is there a viable substitute? And that doesn't mean just, is there an alternative that we can use some of? It means, is there an alternative that can provide cheap, plentiful, reliable energy for billions of people? So the short answer, I talk about this more in some of the resources I'll send out, is, uh, is no, particularly with the unreliable solar and wind. There's no evidence that those can do it uh, on any meaningful scale, in any meaningful time frame. They haven't overcome their fundamental unreliability problems. They're not self-sufficient forms of energy, they're parasitical forms of energy. So when people say, oh yeah, solar costs this and solar costs that, it's not, it's an apples to rotten oranges comparison because it's reliable energy versus unreliable energy. Unreliable energy only works if you have reliable energy for it to be a parasite on. So here's kind of the summary so far is that energy abundance in a world of 8 billion uh, people requires expanded fossil fuel use. So if we're going to consider restricting it due to climate reasons, we have to realize that's going to be a huge hardship. So if, if you're going to say, when people say we have to reduce emissions, they better have a really good reason because it's guaranteed to make people's lives a lot worse if we restrict fossil fuel use. But now the question is, well, maybe it's worth it because maybe we're averting a bigger um, danger. I'm just going to give you a little indication of what I think the evidence is. Um, and then I'll send you some resources to give you more context. But one thing I want to say before going to the evidence is that most people who talk about climate change as a problem do not acknowledge all the facts I've mentioned so far. They don't acknowledge how valuable fossil fuels are. They don't acknowledge how, how energy has made our environment a much better place. They don't acknowledge how inferior the unreliables are. So there's this huge bias against fossil fuels. And so my belief is that the same bias that causes people to uh, underestimate all the benefits of fossil fuels, economic and environmental, it also causes them to exaggerate the drawbacks, including CO2. So here are just some facts that I think are relevant. And this idea is we need to look at the impacts precisely. With, so how big are they? And then how does that relate to all the other benefits and drawbacks? So just in terms of, um, the history of it, it's important when people talk about unprecedented CO2, it might be unprecedented in a given period of 100 years or 1,000 years, but throughout the planet, CO2 levels are actually pretty low, so that's in purple, and temperatures are actually pretty low. And you can see there's not some sort of perfect correlation, although I do believe there is some relationship, but it's not like the planet has never seen these levels before. So the concern is not, oh, the planet is gonna get destroyed, or we have the planet has 12 years, the planet has never seen, this. that's all nonsense. The only plausible concern is that we're changing it at such a rate 
that it's going to disrupt our way of life, right? That it's, we're not going to be able to handle the, the rate of change. But it's not like, oh, the planet is going to be a totally different place. We're going to have some alien devil climate or something like that. It's just a question of, oh, is the rate of change going to be too much for us to handle? Now, in terms of how much this has actually temperatures increased, people will show you graphs and it looks like, oh my gosh, it's gone up. But what they're doing is they're just compressing the y-axis. So this is, on, from a human perspective, how much temperatures have gone up. And this is just compared to the temperature variation in a place like New York. So it's, it's a small amount. It is an amount, and I believe it, it is partially at least caused by CO2, but it's, it's not a huge amount. So we have to be precise about this. I really think it's unjust when people use your product, when they use fossil fuels, and then they condemn it. It's like somebody going onto a plane with a shirt that says, I hate pilots, right? Nobody would tolerate that. And yet people live on fossil fuels and they say, I hate fossil fuels. I think it's important to point out to somebody, not just you're a hypocrite, but that, hey, the reason you're, you are choosing to use fossil fuels, you don't have to. You know, you could choose to die. You could also just choose to take a boat to a third world country. But the reason you choose not to do that and the reason those people are trying to choose more fossil fuels is because it's such an overall positive to your life. So if you're using fossil fuels, you're recognizing in action, this is the best thing for your life. And so if they're choosing your product, they owe you a certain amount of gratitude for that product and certainly not the kind of, of uh, condemnation that you get. So fundamental takeaway is that if we want to advance human flourishing, we need to one, is use more fossil fuels. Like in the foreseeable future, we need more fossil fuels in the world, not less. And at the same time, we want to seek superior alternatives. But alternatives can mean things like nuclear, but it can also mean better uses of fossil fuels, better, cleaner, safer, cheaper uses of fossil fuels. And I think we should, we should be enthusiastic about what both the fossil fuel industry can do to improve and also what other industries can do in the future. But we absolutely shouldn't condemn and restrict the fossil fuel industry now in the name of completely inferior industries just because we consider them green. One final note, when you're having conversations with people. Now, again, I, I, rec uh, I recommend if you put your email uh, on that card, I can send you a whole bunch of resources to share with other people. But just when you're, when you're talking to people, I find it helpful to have two concepts in mind. So one is, and both of these have to do with this issue of framework, how you frame the discussion. One is always make sure when you're talking, talk about human life, human flourishing. Talk about we want to do what's best for human flourishing. That's one. And then two is that we want to look at both the benefits and the drawbacks of all our alternatives. Because people usually, in today's debate, they're not talking much about human flourishing. They're talking about saving the planet, which isn't the same thing. And then they're not talking about the benefits and drawbacks. They're just being super biased and sloppy against fossil fuels. And I find that even people who are raised in environments like I was, if you can just have a calm conversation where you say, hey, we're both human beings. We want the best thing for human beings now and in the future. Let's look carefully at the options. They will be really open to it. So just as I was convinced that fossil fuels are great with this framework, I believe a lot of other people can as well. So Thank you, those of you who are in the industry, thank you for what you do and thank you for having me today.